colleagues and many of my colleagues as well, as I've been hearing all day long. And uh, so it's St. Patrick's Day, as you guys know, and it's also, fun fact, my mom's birthday tomorrow. So I thank you. That's what I was about to do. I, I know she's watching, so you guys be, have to behave. My mom is watching. Uh, happy birthday, mom. Um, so President Biden will host Leo Varadkar, well, Varad sorry, Varadkar, Taoiseach of Ireland here at the White House for a bilateral meeting and St. Patrick's Day celebration, continuing a long-standing St. Patrick's Day tradition here at the White House. To, to kick off the, the celebrations, Taoiseach and his partner, Mr. Bennett, will join Vice President Harris and the second gentleman for breakfast at the Naval Observatory, where they will be serving eggs St. Patrick's, of course. Apparently that's a thing, which is going to be exciting. Later tomorrow morning, the president will meet with uh, Tushuk for a bilateral meeting. In the afternoon, the president and Tushuk will go to the Capitol for the annual Friends of Ireland luncheon. And in the evening, the president and Tushuk will return to the White House for the St. Patrick's <coughs> Day Shamrock presentation ceremony and reception, including a special performance from Ireland's own Niall Horan. Niall is a multi-platinum selling singer-songwriter who has toured the globe, including with One Direction. I'm gonna keep my comments to myself on One Direction. I don't know who they are, sorry. <laughs> Many of you, I'm sure, do, um, but... Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, okay. But I know a few members of my team are truly excited uh, about that, especially Allison. You guys all know Allison, one of our Wranglers. She's been thrilled uh, this past couple of days. So, uh, and all, <laughs> anyway, St. Patrick's Day, we're all excited to be celebrating that tomorrow here at the Biden White House. And so I'm sure you guys will all be celebrating with us and the rest of the country. But today, we have very sad news, a goodbye to one of our day ones, one of our OGs, uh, members of our team, uh, Kevin Munoz, who is sitting right here. Many of you know him. He was here of uh, the day one, obviously, day oneers uh, of this administration. And since Kevin joined uh, the Biden world in 2019 for the campaign, he has affectionately been known as our Florida man for his knowledge of all things Florida. If you have any questions about Florida, Kevin is your guy. Uh, that is his home state, of course, and Dr. Munoz. And uh, we, we, uh, we affectionately call him Dr. Munoz for his leadership during the early days when we were still in the throes of uh, the COVID pandemic. And Kevin took that on uh, without complaint uh, and uh, with clear brilliance and uh, really uh, uh, led us through that path of, uh, of what was happening very early on in the administration. And, uh, and as you know, uh, and again, just to add, he embedded himself into the, um, into the core team of the White House uh, response team on COVID and with their strat strategic decisions and how to move forward on COVID-19. And Kevin has just been, again, brilliant and fantastic in that role. Those were difficult days, as you all know, working around the clock, and Kevin was exactly the right person for the job. Uh, he thrives in the pressure cooker and has been a strategic and effective communicator on some of the most complex and critical issues we have faced as a country. Kevin has also been an important spokesperson for us, for us on, on issues uh, of deep importance to the Latino community and also LGBTQ Americans, and he has helped reach Spanish-speaking Americans across the country as a strong and effective bilingual communicator. Kevin is wicked, wicked smart. Uh, and has a huge heart. He cares about all of these issues and he cares about his colleagues and he certainly cares about the work that we've been doing here these last two years and we will miss him dearly. And, uh, but he won't go far. And also his birthday was yesterday. So happy birthday, Kevin. But we love you and we will miss you. And thank you so much for your dedication and for your service. With that, Darlene. Thank you. Um, two questions on banking. So the Treasury Secretary was on the Hill this morning testifying that the system remains sound and people can be confident about their deposits. When the President addressed the situation on Monday, he said that he was going to ask Congress and the banking regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to make sure that this type of failure is less likely to happen in the future. At this point, can you be a little more specific in terms of 
precisely what the president is looking for from Congress and the banking regulators on this issue? So to answer uh, the, sec the first question, I guess, uh, we have seen bipartisan support on a piece of legislation, Warner Porter bill. Uh, and so we appreciate those folks putting their ideas together and putting that on the table. So we're going to work closely uh, at that bill and other regulatory changes as well. Uh, as you all know, the Obama-Biden administration put in place tough requirements after the 2008 financial crisis to make sure that this sort of crisis would not happen again. But unfortunately, in the last administration in 2018, uh, some of those uh, rolled back some of, some of those uh, regulations that would have been incredibly important as we move forward. Uh, so as the President said, Congress and regulators must strengthen those rules for larger banks so that this doesn't happen again. Again. And so, again, there's a legislation that we are encouraged to see, and uh, and we'll you know continue to work with Congress on what else uh, what else can be done. Uh, and uh, but as we know, we can't. Uh, there's quite a bit that we can do uh, administratively, but without Congress, uh, there's not. Without Congress, we can't fully deal with this issue. Uh, so, as with your question on the regulators. Uh, you know, already underway, the regulators at the at the president appointed over the last few years, reversing the changes that we saw in 2000, in 2018 uh, under the last administration that I just mentioned. Uh, but that again, but we need Congress to take a uh, we can't let Congress off the hook, and they need to take action. So it's going to take both Congress and regulators uh, to strengthen those rules, and so that's what we're calling on uh, to do. And secondly, there are reports that a group of banks and other financial institutions are working on a $30 billion or so plan to shore up first the public bank in California. Um, can you say what role the U.S. government has in terms of trying to pull this rescue package together? So I'm not going to comment on any specific actions or any specific institutions from here because of the actions that the that the regulars took over the weekend at the president's direction uh, depositors know that they are safe and uh, and banks have access to resources to meet those de to meet those depositors needs but and demand but i'm not going to get into any specific uh, situations from here thank you a uh, question on tiktok over a hundred million people now use this app what is your message to them about why you're so concerned about this platform what is the president's greatest fear about TikTok? So we've talked about this many times from here before. The president has spoken about this. Look, we are want to make sure that our administration, uh, okay. we're OK over there? Just right. <laughs> oh, budget TikTok. <laughs> Smart. OK, um, so look, we've expressed concerns over China's uh, potential use of software platforms that could endanger or threaten uh, America's safety and their national security. So that is the president's concern. That is why uh, we have uh, called on Congress to take action. We see a bipartisan piece of legislation that you know that we are supporting. It's called the Restrict Act, as you all know and been covering. And so that's the president's main priority, to make sure when it comes to their safety, when it comes to their security, when it comes to our national security, that those things are protected. And so that has been the president's focus over the last couple of years. You know, last month, the president said he wasn't sure if the U.S. should ban TikTok when he was asked about this. Now the administration seems to be hardening its stance. You're backing this legislation, as you mentioned. You know, we've learned you know, now warning that a possible ban uh, could be at risk here. What changed? So look, when it comes to CFIUS, uh, which is, I'm not going to get ahead of CFIUS, they're the ones who are reviewing this, uh, reviewing uh, this particular software and app, uh, TikTok, obviously. Uh, so not going to get ahead of their process. There's a process here. We try to stay away from that process. Uh, again, going to support the bipartisan uh, legislation that I've just spoke to. Look. The bottom line is that when it comes to uh, potential threats to our national security, when it comes to uh, the safety of Americans, uh, when it comes to their privacy, we're going to speak out and we're going to be very clear about that. And the president has been the last two years. And so we're asking Congress to act. We're asking Congress to move forward uh, with this bipartisan legislation, the Restrict Act, as I just mentioned, and we're going to continue to do so. And just one more on this. You know, China says that the U.S. hasn't presented evidence that, that this app threatens U.S. national security. They say that this is simply about suppressing foreign companies. Is there evidence that the U.S. has that has been presented? Look, what I can say is CFIUS has a process that they're going through. We're going to let them go through their process. We have concerns, as we have said many times before. 
uh, about this particular software, uh, so, uh, platform, software platforms. Uh, and, uh, and so we take the national security very seriously. The president takes that very seriously. The safety of Americans uh, very seriously. The privacy of Americans very seriously. And so we're not going to get ahead of the review, but certainly uh, we, uh, again, support this uh, bipartisan legislation that we're coming, that we're seeing out of, the, out of uh, Congress. Just continuing on the questions about the banking sector, um, so the Biden administration has expressed a lot of concern in the past about consolidation mm -hmm. in other sectors. Um, you've spoken about meat packing, shipping, ocean shipping, um, oil companies. Are you worried that this crisis surrounding several regional banks could lead to a consolidation and a concentration in the larger banking sector? And, uh, and then I'll have another one. So promoting competition uh, in our in the American economy, we see that as a priority. You see, you hear the president say these words and about repeat right now, which is capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, <clears throat> and so that is something that you've heard the president say multiple times. His executive order on this particular issue, promoting cap capitalism, oh sorry, competition, pardon me, specifically encourages the Justice Department in consultation with the Fed, the FDIC, and Comptroller of the Currency to revitalize merger and. Oversight. So again, this is something that the president believes in. Uh, he, he believes that we have to have capitalism, and you can't have capitalism without competition, and that isn't capitalism. And so I'll just leave it there. And it isn't, again, the last thing I would say is an important part of our American economy. But I mean, the question is, are you concerned and what can you do about it? You know, to event, as, as consumers are now making decisions, having seen what happened with SVB and the signature, what's happening now with First Republic, I mean, what tools do you have to push back against a further concentration in this critical sector? So look, as it relates to specific banks and institutions, you know, I would, I would, uh, um, I would refer you to the relevant banking regulators, so I'd leave that there, and that's why the president, but more broadly, that's why the president took the actions that he did over the weekend. Remember, he directed his uh, Treasury Secretary and the NSC Director uh, to uh, come up with a plan on how to deal with what we were seeing with SVB, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank, and so they took action, and now what we, what we believe and what you heard from uh, the Secretary today, which is decisive and f forceful actions were taken by the government to strengthen public confidence in our banking system. So there, sh there should be confidence in our banking system. No taxpayer money is being used or put at risk with this action. And lastly, she said our banking system remains sound and that Americans can feel confident that their deposits will be there when they need them. This, is, this week's actions demonstrate our resolute commitment to ensure the depositor savings remain safe. Again, this is something that happened and occurred at the President's direction, uh, and we want to make sure that Americans do indeed feel confident. I'm not going to speak to any specific bank, as you just asked me uh, about the particular bank in California. We clearly are going to be monitoring. Okay, and then just on the international front on the banking sector, um, you know, we've seen trouble now with Credit Suisse. The Swiss authorities are stepping in, offering a credit line. What had been discussed there was also a further consolidation. So the biggest bank in Switzerland, UBS, um, stepping into aid Credit Suisse. You know, would you have concerns about that on a global scale if you start to see this um, movement, you know, kind of happening globally? So, look, we're monitoring the situation. I know the Treasury uh, has been in touch with their own Swiss, their Swiss counterparts, which is important. And so we're glad that the Swiss, uh, Swiss Central Bank provided a reassurance in, in the form of a loan facility yesterday. Uh, but I will say that what we're seeing currently with the Credit Suisse is a distinct issue, and it's a problem. It's, it's, and its problems uh, are not related to the current economic situation, the current economic environment. Uh, again, this is a distinct issue uh, that we're currently seeing, and we're having uh, the, the Treasury Secretary's, uh, the Treasury, I should say, more broadly, is having conversation with their counter I'm sorry, counterparts. Labor's point. I just want, want to see what the Biden administration's policy on this is. Do you discourage? further consolidation in banking globally or I would refer, I would refer you to the Department of Treasury they have been in, in close contact with their Swiss counterparts as it relates to this particular uh, uh, issue this particular bank uh, but again want to be very clear what we're seeing with the Credit Suisse is a distinct situation uh, it is not it is not uh, it does not speak to the current economics uh, economic environment that we're in Go ahead. Thanks, Kareem. Um, you, you referenced the Dodd-Frank uh, rules just a, a few moments ago. Do you believe that Silicon Valley, <coughs> excuse me, do you believe that Silicon Valley's uh, 
bank's failure could have been averted had those Dodd-Frank rules not been rolled back during the previous administration? So right now, and the president said this in his remarks on Monday, that we, we got to get a full accounting of what happened. We need to know exactly what happened uh, uh, so we know who to hold accountable here. Uh, right now, uh, his economic team, the president's economic team, is focused on stabilizing the financial system and protecting depositors, not investors. We've been very clear about this. Uh, but again, it is not 2008. The banking system is far more resilient on a better uh, foundation, thanks to the tough requirements that were put in place by the uh, Obama-Biden administration. And I just said this moment, moments ago, in 2018, we saw what the, the Trump administration did. Uh, they did roll back some of those tough requirements. But again, we need to see exactly do a full uh, full review, get a full accounting of what occurred, uh, uh, so we can make sure to hold those uh, to account. And the administration moved to insure all deposits at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank through the FDIC's deposit insurance fund. So will that be the policy going forward for other bank failures? And in terms of future legislation, does the administration support changes to the existing $250,000 cap on uh, FDIC insurance limit for checkings and, and savings accounts? So again, I'm not going to uh, get ahead or go, get into hypotheticals on um, what uh, what the future is going to hold, uh, and uh, and I've said this moments ago as well, which is look, we need Congress to act, uh, and uh, we need Congress to to take a look of, of of what else can be done. That's why we're supporting the legislation, the bipartisan legislation that I just mentioned. Uh, look, the president, as I mentioned also earlier, the president appointed uh, appointed uh, regulators over the past two years uh, to reverse the changes that we. Saw uh, in the last administration, uh, but again, Congress needs to act. As far as the 250,000 uh, deposit insurance limit, uh, we have we have more more to say on the specific regulatory changes in the next few days. I'm not going to get ahead of of uh, what the regulators what the regulators are going to decide moving forward. But that's something that you guys are looking. I'm at. just not I'm just not going to get into specifics or get ahead of what they're what they're currently looking at or what we're going what they're going to be announcing. And then just on a different topic, um, in terms of the the video that uh, you guys released of this uh, U.S. drone that was intercepted by a Russian fighter jet. Uh, can you tell us uh, if the president was involved in the decision to release that footage and why he or the administration felt it was important to get that out to the public? So look, this is something that uh, I believe the Pentagon believed it was important to get that out so that the public can see. I don't have any, uh, I don't have any internal conversations to read out uh, about uh, about how it came to be. I know that uh, there is, uh, you know, there's many times during this this administration where we feel it's important uh, to have transparency and to show the American people exactly what occurred. Uh, just don't have any uh, internal conversations to lay out for you at this time. Yeah, thank you, Corrine. Uh, what is the White House's reaction to environmental activists critical of the Biden administration's approval of the Willow Oil Project? They argue that the president has undermined his own goals uh, on climate change in approving this. So a couple of things there. Um, look, the president, uh, you know, when it comes to, you're talking about the Willow Project? Yeah, the Willow Oil Project. Look, the president kept his word when he, uh, where he can, where, where he can, by law. Right, uh, that is important to note. Uh, and uh, as the Interior Department said, some of the company's leases are decades old, granted by prior administrations. The company has a legal right to those uh, leases. The department's options are limited when there are legal contracts uh, in place. For example, the DOI solicitor under uh, President Clinton uh, and law professor at U.S. Hastings said they have lease rights and that can't be ignored. That's a big figure uh, on the scale in the favor of development. And so I'll, I'll leave it there. But again, the president is uh, delivering the most uh, aggressive climate agenda in the U.S. history, and that is going to be uh, his continued uh, uh, his continued commitment to the American people. And so is it the position of the White House that there was no other option other than approving the uh, permits for the property? Well, I just laid out. There was, there were th those, uh, uh, the le there was legal right to, they had legal right to those leases, right? And he, the president's going to do what he can under the, uh, as the law permits. And so, again, this is a president who's delivered on the most aggressive uh, climate agenda in the U.S. history, and he's going to continue to do that. And do you have a reaction or response to the two lawsuits filed by conservation groups against the, uh, the government seeking to stop the project? I'm, just, I'm not going to comment on any uh, lawsuits at this time. Go ahead. On Ukraine, in the coming months, does the administration have any plans to ask Congress to pass an additional aid supplemental for Ukraine beyond the $6 billion that the president asked for in his budget request, 
and are there concerns about whether the political will to do so on the Hill is eroding? So look, thanks to the bipartisan congressional support uh, for Ukraine that was passed in September, we believe we have uh, the resources we need through the end of this fiscal year, and I think that's important. Again, that was done in a bipartisan way. Uh, so of course we're going to continue uh, to elevate uh, whether any additional resources are needed based on the conditions that we're currently seeing on the ground uh, that we do, we see as we move forward on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, but again, we appreciate the bipartisan support that we saw in September. Uh, we believe that uh, it, it's going to go through the end of uh, end of the fiscal year. And uh, again, we're this, everything that we have done as it relates to Ukraine has been done in a bipartisan way. Thanks, Green. You said the White House tries to stay away from the CFIUS process, but has there been any communication between the White House and CFIUS on the issue of TikTok? I, I don't have any conversations to read out at this time. I just don't have any. I'm, we This is a process that's done uh, 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 on its own, separately, uh, but certainly I don't have any uh, conversation to read out. Just another one. Um, are, are, is the administration planning for different contingencies as it relates to the case over the abortion pill? Particularly as yesterday, it seemed that ju the judge seemed receptive to the argument that the pill is unsafe. So I want to be careful here. I'm not going to get into uh, any litigation that's currently happening. Uh, uh, get stay out of or put, say anything uh, that might get in the way there. But this is about FDA's authority uh, to make its independent evidence-based uh, decision on drugs. This is what this is about. Decisions on what medication can be used in our country should not be determined in a court. They should be determined based on their safety, science, and the data. And so the bottom line is that uh, mifeprestone is safe, and there is no question about that. We know that because it's been around for two decades. It's in more than 60 countries across, across the globe, clearly. It, is, it has been exhaustively shown to be safe with real data on countless occasion, and it has been used in this country, again, for more than 20 years. So we'll wait for the next steps, not going to get involved in what the judge said uh, yesterday. We're going to see uh, where this goes, and uh, and we're not going to say much more from here. I understand. I just, uh, on that, there was some criticism about the White House after the draft decision of Roe v. Wade, or the, the, the opinion that overturned Roe v. Wade that they felt the White House had weeks to prepare for the what became the overturning of that opinion and uh, activists and even some Democratic lawmakers felt that the White House did not have a robust plan in place to respond to that. So I'm wondering in this case, is there planning underway here at the White House in the uh, in case this... this There's been discussion uh, here at the White House about what could happen next uh, in case the judge decides to uh, make this really uh, unprecedented, potentially unprecedented decision. But I just want to go back to uh, the Roe v. Wade and what are, and and uh, the criticism that you just said that we received. And I would dispute those. I would dispute those with criticism because on the day, uh, because on the day that it it happened, you heard from the president. He laid out uh, some executive actions uh, from from this White House on how to move forward. Uh, this is a president and the vice president has been very vocal on, on the pr making sure that the health of women are protected uh, across uh, just across the country. We're talking about millions and millions of women. And he's going to continue to do that. That is not going to change from this White House. Uh, and uh, we've continued to take action uh, since then uh, through the HHS and other and DOJ. Uh, and other uh, parts of his administration. This is a, an issue that's important to this administration. And again, what can potentially occur here uh, is uh, is uh, sadly, uh, you know, unprecedented. And this is uh, this is going to put uh, all everything that we have seen since June, when Roe and uh, Roe v. Wade was uh, was was uh, taken away from women, uh, puts women's lives in, in danger. And now we're seeing. Uh, anti-abortion legislation across the country. Again, dangerous uh, to the health of women. Uh, and we're seeing, uh, you know, national Republicans talking about uh, a national ban. Again, that is dangerous uh, to women. That's something that the President's going to continue to speak out against. Yeah, Christine, thank you so much. The NSA Director General has called TikTok a loaded gun because so many Americans rely on it, uh, both for social media and they say they get the news from TikTok. Does the president, does the administration agree with that assessment? I'm just not going to get ahead of uh, any any comments that's been made on TikTok uh, at this time. Again, CFIUS is looking at, is doing a review. We're going to let them do their review. We've been clear about our concerns, express our concerns with the software, uh, this particular app, because we, the president, 
believes that it's important to, to protect uh, the privacy and the safety of Americans. It's important uh, to protect our national security. But I'm not going to get ahead of the review. Again, we're, gonna sh we're, we're showing, and we've been very clear in supporting the bipartisan legislation. Let me try it this way. Does the president think that Americans should be on TikTok? Again, I'm not going to I'm not going to speak to uh, to that. What I can speak to is what the president believes that he needs to do, which is making sure that the safety and privacy of Americans are protected, uh, and he'll speak to that. But I'm not going to speak to, to actions that the American people should take or not take. I want to follow up on the video that was released of the drone. Given that it clearly refuted the initial accounts that were offered by the Russians about what happened. Is there a broader impact on U.S.-Russia relations? In other words, has it made an already incredibly tense relationship worse? Do you mean, is it going to lead to escalation? Well, look, a couple of things there. Uh, and we've been clear, the Pentagon has been clear, my colleagues at NSC has been clear as well, the actions by Russian pilots uh, in international airspace were, were reckless and dangerous. Uh, we have raised those concerns directly with Russian leadership, and we will continue to exercise our rights in international airspace. Uh, clearly, we do not seek armed conflicts with Russia. We maintain direct lines of communication for reasons like this to minimize risk of escalation. But again, we do not seek armed conflict with Russia, uh, and so I'll leave it there. One more, if I could, on the Willow Project. In addition to the environmental groups, there are a lot of young voters who are criticizing um, the president green lighting. Um, an oil drilling venture in Alaska. What is his message to those young voters who feel like this is a betrayal? Look, this is a, the message is this. This is a president that has delivered on the most aggressive climate agenda in the United States history. Uh, and he's going to continue to do that. And he has, he has the receipts for it, right? He has conserved more land and water in the first year than any president since JFK. He has fully closed off the U.S. Arctic Ocean to new oil and gas leasing. He has secured record investment in climate resilience and environmental justice. And his economic agenda is fueling an unprecedented clean energy manufacturing boom that is bringing energy costs down, reducing America's resilience on oil, and finally putting us back on track to meet our clean energy projects. Again, this is a president who has done more on climate change than any other president in history, and he's committed to it, and he's going to continue to do so. Okay. Um, will any White House officials be meeting with the president of Taiwan when she's here in a couple of weeks? And is there still concerns that there could be fallout for her meeting with Speaker McCarthy? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a, a trip to. Uh, I don't believe the trip has been announced or uh, Taiwan has announced any transit at this time. There's a couple of things I do want to say because I know this has come up a couple of times. Uh, and so any any potential transit that Taiwan might be making certainly would refer you to Taiwan. I will say that transits of the United States by high-level Taiwan officials are consistent with longstanding U.S. practice, the unofficial, unofficial nature of our relations with Taiwan and U.S. policy, which remains unchanged. Every Taiwan president has transited the United States. Uh, president Tsai has transited the United States at least six times, about six times, since taking office in 2016. Uh, and done so without incident. Uh, such transits are undertaken out of consideration for the safety, comfort, convenience, and dignity of the passenger and are in keeping with our One China policy, which remains unchanged. Transits are not visits. They are private and official and unofficial. Uh, so I will also note that high-level Taiwan officials have typically met with members of Congress, which is a separate and co-equal branch of government during past transit. But I believe that Taiwan has not yet announced a transit at this time. I have a quick one on banking. Is there any actions that the White House is taking right now before Congress can pass any new legislation to prevent further contagion, further banks from bailing, and, and that potentially bleeding into the economy? Well, as I mentioned, as, as you heard from the President directly uh, over the weekend, and he, he talked about this on Monday, uh, he directed his NEC and sec Treasury Secretary uh, to, uh, uh, to work with the bank regulators uh, to take action. And you heard from directly from the Secretary of Treasury today about what those actions were able to do to give confidence to the American people, making sure that ta taxpayers do not have to pay uh, or not responsible for uh, what investors did, and making sure that, uh, that our banking system continues and remains sound. And so those actions that, uh, that the government took, Weekend. 
But I think since well, I can tell you this that we have we have said that there's going to be um, uh, more will be said on this once we find out how we how this occurred and getting to the bottom of exactly uh, what happened. The president thinks that's very important to do. He spoke about that on Monday, so not going to get ahead of that. Uh, in the meantime, Congress needs to act. It's important for Congress to act. Uh, there are things that we can do in the administration, but in order to really deal with this issue, uh, we have to act. That's why uh, that's why we're not in 2008 because of the actions that the Obama uh, Biden White House took. But again, many of those actions that were taken and for to uh, after what happened occurred in 2008 were rolled back by the last administration. So we have to actually address those issues. And so we're asking Congress to do just that. Go ahead, Alicia. Thank you, Corrine. Um, President Biden has said before that he himself does not have TikTok on his phone. Do you know if any of his grandchildren or any other family members who he spends time with has it on their phones? I, I, I do not know. I mean, he spends time with them. So I hear he spends time with them. He's been influenced I, I hear by you. them before. I to hear. I, TikTok, it's just so. it's just not something that I'm aware of, uh, and uh, I'm just not going to speak to. Uh, they are private citizens. I'm just not going to speak to what they have on their phones or not. Got it. And um, on the Polish fighter jets, just last month, the Russians warned that if the UK provided fighter jets to Ukraine, it would have serious military and political ramifications for the entire world. I know that John Kirby stressed that this was. An, a decision by Poland, but how does President Biden think that decision will impact the war and also potentially impact NATO? So as, as my colleague at NSC said, Admiral Kirby, it is a sovereign decision that is made by uh, a country. It, it's their decision to make. Uh, Poland has been providing, as you know, a significant amount of security assistance to Ukraine, as more than 50 nations around the world, alongside the United States, has done as well. And so, look, we are committed, uh, and we have, we've said this before, and because of the President's leadership, you've seen, uh, you've seen uh, NATO uh, be unified, you've seen the West be unified, uh, to commit it to uh, making sure that Ukraine is able to, the people of Ukraine is able to fight for their democracy and for their freedom. Remember, this is a war, as you all know and covered, this is a war that Russia started. Uh, they are the ones that are invading a sovereign nation. And so we believe it's important, along with our allies, to, uh, to help Ukraine uh, the best that we can. And so we're going to continue doing historic amount of security assistance, uh, as we have done, and to make sure that uh, they have what they need to continue to fight uh, for their democracy and their freedom. I hear what you're saying about the decision making, but does the president think the decision will only impact Poland and Ukraine? Can you say that again? What do you mean a decision? Well, Poland? it was Poland's decision, right? Yeah. But now that they are delivering these fighter jets, how will that impact NATO allies and you, the war, given what Russia has warned about providing fighter jets just last month? Well, look, we have said it is important for our uh, partners, our um, uh, across the globe uh, to do everything that they can to uh, to help Ukraine. And so that hasn't changed, uh, you know. And uh, as you saw, the president was in Poland recently, had a one-on-one a, a -on -one, um, uh, inter engagement with President Duda. And you saw their commitment by both leaders to continue uh, to do everything that they can, uh, that we can, uh, to give Ukraine what they need. And the President was, uh, President Duda was very, very thankful to the President uh, for everything that we have done. We were thankful to President Duda being, uh, you know, being right there at the border alongside Ukraine, having to, uh, having to be uh, uh, one of the closest ally uh, that have to, that has to make sure that uh, Ukraine has what they need, but also, uh, uh, also, um, uh, be part of that alliance uh, that continues to provide the security assistance that Ukraine needs. I'm not going to, again, it's a sovereign decision. It is their decision to make. Uh, but you have seen a strong alliance, a strong partners, a strong West. NATO has is, is come together to do everything that we can to make sure that the people of Ukraine have, uh, have uh, the security assistance that they need on the ground uh, to fight for their freedom. And I'll just leave it there. And then just quickly, did President Biden know that that was President Duda's decision before he announced it yesterday during that press conference? So we were informed uh, by by the decision uh, by the Pol uh, by Poland uh, to uh, provide the jets to Ukraine. So we continue to closely coordinate with our allies and partners, including Poland, uh, as we provide assistance to Ukraine. Uh, yesterday, Secretary Austin, as you probably know, the 10th uh, hosted the 10th Ukraine 
defense contact group in which countries around the world continue to step up, support Ukraine as it defends itself from Russia, Russian aggression. And uh, that's what you're going to continue to see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there were some new figures out today uh, showing the highest maternal mortality rate in half a century, or, or a little more, in fact. And uh, of course, that, make, that puts the U.S. right at the top of wealthy countries in terms of uh, maternal mortality. Um, does the White House, you know, have any plans about this? And so, thank you. Yeah, I have a statement here that uh, we wanted to share with all of you. Look, the data that uh, came out today show for far too long, pregnant and postmortem women have gotten the short, have been short shifted here. Uh, which is exactly why the president and congressional Democrats are working to improve their access to health care, to lower health care cost, and to significantly increase investments in improving maternal health. But meanwhile, what we're seeing from the other side, what we're seeing from uh, Republicans, are doing the, they're doing the complete opposite, which is consistent and on brand for them, working to gut health care for Americans, repeal Affordable Health Care Act, and make deep cuts to Medicaid, which is the last thing we should do, given that 40 percent of women have Medicaid coverage at the time of delivery. It is incomprehensible and it is incredibly dangerous what we're seeing from uh, our Republicans' uh, uh, colleagues in Congress. The most powerful country in the world should not be accepting this as a reality. This is a crisis and we are taking action. The President and the Vice President will continue this fight to ensure pregnant and postmodern women and all Americans have the care they need uh, to stay healthy. And that's a commitment that you'll see from this President. Go ahead, April. Uh, two questions. First, on the abortion pill in the Texas case, what happens to disadvantaged women, particularly in the black and brown community, if this pill is abolished or not allowed in that state? What happens? So look, I'm not going to get ahead of the decision that the courts are going to be making at any time soon today, who knows, a couple of days, going to stay out of that. Uh, but we've been very clear. We've been very clear that what is what could potentially happen uh, is unprecedented. We're talking about a pill that's been around for two decades. It's been in more than uh, 60 countries ac across, across the globe. Uh, that is safe. And this is something that the FDA should decide uh, on what's safe uh, and what could be what could be uh, beneficial to women's health. So yes, if that this were to occur again, I'm not going to want to be very careful here. Uh, this would be devastating to those to that very group that you just listed out, April. So you're questioning um, his definition of qualification for what's safe, the judge. I'm not questioning anything at this time. This is something that the judge uh, has to decide, want to be very careful. This is an ongoing litigation. Uh, but what could happen would be unprecedented. Uh, and the president and this administration, you're going to continue to hear us uh, speak uh, speak up for women uh, across the country. And next question, Shanquilla Robinson. Um, ben Crum has sent a letter to the White House about this case. This young woman was killed in Mexico in October of last year. The suspect is in this country, along with those back here, along with those who were present during the, the, the deadly beating. Okay? He sent a letter asking for extradition of the suspect to Mexico for the Mexican authorities to deal with, or if not, take jurisdiction of it here and deal with it. What's next? What's the White House willing to do? So let me just first say our hearts go out to uh, Ms. Robinson's family um, and friends. It is devastating what occurred, uh, and certainly um, uh, the, the tragedy is just devastating. And we've been following the news here, uh, but because, uh, because there's an FBI un investigation underway, there's very little that we can say. Uh, we got to, as you know, we are very careful about um, criminal investigations or any uh, investigations that are uh, currently happening uh, through DOJ in this particular case, FBI. But our hearts go out uh, to, um, again, to the families. And I would have to refer you to the DOJ and the State Department on well, this. Let me ask you this. So since there's an FBI investigation, does that mean nothing happens until the investigation is complete? Or, I mean, could, I mean, the United States has extradition, an uh, extradition treaty with Mexico. Is it, is all of this contingent upon the FBI investigation. What I can say is there's an investigation going on, so this is something that the FBI has to speak to. So that's why I'm referring you to the Department of Justice. Uh, and it's also an issue of the State Department, again, so would refer you to the State Department as it relates uh, to another country and the diplomatic conversations that occur there. Uh, but uh, again, this is something that we're clearly following here. 
uh, and uh, our hearts go out to her family. And last question on this though, are there capabilities for the United States to take jurisdiction over this if it doesn't go, if, if the, the suspect is not extradited back? Look, April, I understand the question and I appreciate the questions, all important questions to ask of me. But again, there's an ongoing investigation, so I would refer to the Department but of Justice. Not process, not necessarily the investigation. Do, does the but there is, a, but there is a process that's currently happening because of the investigation, so I would refer you to the Department of Justice and also the State Department as there are, you know, this is a diplomatic issue uh, that needs to be handled on, on that end. Okay. And then, um, I'm sorry, and then I'll I know you were asked about this last week at that point and all didn't have an answer. Um, I wondered if you do have an answer now as to whether or not the president will sign the COVID origins intelligence bill that was unanimously passed. So well, it's so we are. Thank you for the question. I know I was asked about it. I believe on the plane uh, on Monday, as you just mentioned. So we're looking at it. Uh, we have continued to share information with members of Congress. And as you know, just months after the president came into office, he uh, asked his intelligence community uh, to double down and to take a look of the of uh, the origins uh, of the COVID origins because we believe it's important to get to the bottom of this and to get and also if uh, once we have uh, once the intelligence community has made the made the assessments clearly we would share that with the public as it relates to the legislation we're going to continue to we're going to take a look at it and certainly we'll have more to share but you haven't made a decision whether no sign it or we're, not. we're just taking a look we're taking a look into the uh, into the bill go ahead christina in the back thank you Colleen. um can you confirm if the administration is considering redesignating temporary protected status to Nicaraguans and what that would look like? So we don't have anything to share on that at this time, any announcement. As you know, when it comes to temporary uh, protection status, that is something that is housed under the Department of Homeland Security, and they, they designate. Uh, that would be something for Secretary Mayorkas to designate, uh, and so I just don't have anything for you on that. Uh, I, would, I would refer you to the Department of Homeland Security. One more question on the, on the video. Is there a red line for, for Russia? Is there a point where these aggressions become an act of war? And I, are they aware of that? So look, as I said earlier, uh, we have had the lines of communications with Russia has been open. We've had uh, those conversations uh, with, um, with uh, Russia. Uh, and so I'll, I'll leave it there and we'll continue to make those uh, communication, th th have those communications. We're not looking for escalation. I said that moments ago. Uh, and, uh, and I'll just leave it there. That is not what we're looking for uh, with Russia. Um, I'm going to try to take more in the back. Go ahead, um, Courtney. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about travel <coughs> requirements. Um, the U.S. lifted the requirement for COVID-19 tests for travelers flying from China. Do you have any update on the vaccine requirement for international travels in general? We don't have any updates at this time. And a second question on um, parole. The U.S. has had a humanitarian parole program that you opened for the four countries from Latin America. Um, that program is being challenged in court in Texas. Can you talk about the implications of that case? I know that that type of parole has been a tool that the president has used repeatedly in the last two years, not just for the Southern Hemisphere, but for other humanitarian crises. Yeah, so as, we, as you know, that parole program that we put into place is working. Uh, it's working uh, the... Um, uh, it, it's, it's gone down, those four countries crossing over uh, coming coming to the border has gone down by more than 95 percent, uh, and so this is a, a this is a program that the president was able to to utilize because of the tools that he had in front of him. Remember, Congress is not acting. Republicans refused to take action. The president put forth a comprehensive immigration reform bill on day one, and they have refused to work with us. So again, the president uh, put this put this program together, and again, it's working. And instead. Instead of con Republicans in Congress or Republicans working with us on fixing this issue or dealing with a real issue, the border, uh, they want to repeal a program that is actually doing what it is supposed to be doing. So this is a political stunt by them. This is something that they're not serious about. Uh, and uh, it, it is unfortunate. Uh, look, we're going to secure the border. Uh, and do the work uh, that you've heard from um, from Mayorkas on this, do the work, Secretary Mayorkas on this, do the work to continue to do that. Uh, but we need Congress to act. We need Republicans to seriously come to the table and deal with it. Repealing a program that is working uh, is just doesn't make sense. And it's a political stunt. 
I know. I know. I have to go. Uh, I'll take one more. Go ahead, Cameron. It's green. Um, you laid out a very detailed schedule for the president tomorrow with the Prime Minister of Ireland, but it did not include a two-and-two -two press conference. Can you say why not, and whether that might be added to the schedule tomorrow? So you, I think you're having a pattern with a lot of the world leaders who are coming well, to the White House. Uh, well, I've spoken up to this many times when it comes to diplomatic. Up in the briefing that it's not I, part of the schedule. Right. And my, I, again, I brought it up many times, and I gave an exp explanation. These are diplomatic conversations that happen with the with uh, uh, with the countries that are visiting uh, and it is something that uh, is decided in that way um, but uh, there will no there will not be a two plus two tomorrow as you just noted but again this is in coordination uh, with um, with the country that come to visit uh, here at the White House, you're going to have an opportunity, uh, or your colleagues will have an opportunity uh, to ask questions uh, during the uh, the uh, pool spray uh, of the Oval at the Oval that that happen every time a a, um, a a head of state visits. So that is an opportunity uh, to be able to pose a question uh, to the president or uh, or the head of state that is visiting uh, the White House at, on that day. But again, this is coordinated. That's not true. No, he has, he's answered questions. He got yelled at. It's not. Here's. Here's but here's. But here's. I hear you guys. I hear you guys. I hear you guys. Um, I, look, the two plus two is something that is done in coordination with the country that is visiting. That is not something that is unilaterally decided, decided. That is something that is in discussion with the other country. I was asked about the two plus two. I was also I also was adding that uh, there is an opportunity where press will be in the room with the two leaders. Uh, I cannot speak to if who's going to take questions or who's not going to take questions. Uh, as you know, this is a president that takes shouted questions often, but the two plus two is not a unilateral decision. It is a, a decision that happens uh, with the visiting country uh, in coordination with them. With that, guys, I'll see you. Thank you. Question about how you business affairs.